guys can be seated. What an awesome day. And we are excited just to celebrate. We are glad to have so many uh, guests in the building today. Uh, if you are visiting today for the very first time, you showed up on the right Sunday, you know. Uh, sometimes you, someone uh, came up to me this morning and said, today uh, we've been here exactly a year. This was the same week last year that we came for the very first time. And uh, so we'll, we'll, and they said, we didn't stay for lunch, but I said, you better stay for lunch today. And uh, good to see Paul and Jessica and uh, the Carson family. Uh, their kids are growing up so fast. It's, it's amazing. But uh, glad to have them back in the building. Many others around the, the building as well. If I didn't uh, see you already, hopefully I'll get to see you after the service this morning. 37 years of leading and creating disciples of Jesus. You can bring the lights back down. Our mission has not changed over all of these years. In fact, it's just as clear as it ever has been. Our mission is together we lead and create disciples of Jesus. That is why we exist. That has not changed in all of these years. In fact, uh, we began as a Bible study. Some of you may not know this. As a Bible study in a house where McDonald's now sits. So this morning as I was getting my mocha frappe and my uh, bacon, egg, and cheese McGriddle, uh, that's kind of where everything began and uh, 37 years ago. And uh, it began as a, as a small uh, Bible study. Uh, then moved across the street to the McCullers Roytown building. Uh, right behind Harris Teeter. I think there's a biker church that meets there now. And uh, we met there for a year. And then our very first anniversary, our first birthday, we moved into the building now where Kids City meets on Sunday. And so back then, it was a, uh, there were tobacco fields everywhere. In fact, if you grew up in the area, you know this area was in the middle of nowhere. In fact, it, it, we laugh about it today because I mean, now it feels like we're in the middle of everywhere. Everybody is, is here, and you know, years ago you would say it's the church beside Hardee's. I mean, no one wants to be known as the church beside Hardee's, all right? But uh, now we say it's the church across from Costco, and everyone's like, oh yeah, I know exactly where that is. I, I shop there every week. And, uh, but it's awesome to see how God has brought the, do the world to our doorstep. We're excited to see what God is doing and, and see that the process of making disciples doesn't change even though the times change, it, but it requires clarity of process. It requires having a heart for seeing disciples born and growing to reproduce themselves. Real ministry is messy. I say that because even this week, uh, we experienced some, some crazy situations and I, I was looking at our staff the other day, I said, Real ministry, people think as a pastor that all you do is, is preach on Sunday. That's the only day a week that you work. And they think that you dedicate babies, uh, do baptisms, and uh, marry people. And that's the, the brunt of what you do. And I'll say, really, that's just a small portion of what happens on a daily basis. Because real ministry requires you to get involved in people's lives. That's where discipleship happens. That's where life change takes place. And it requires uh, us to pour our lives into other people. And, and folks, I, I love seeing the life change that takes place. The reality is if you're making disciples, it requires sacrifice. It requires investing. It requires you to have a burden for those who might look different than you, that might have a different political view than you do. They might be from a different part of the country than you. And, and you say, hey, God still loves people from California? Absolutely. And he loves the Yankees? Absolutely. He loves those from West Virginia? Yes, all of them. Whether you have a full set of teeth or not, God still loves you. And it doesn't matter what your path, I, I, I laugh at all that, but... We're just as crazy down here. I mean, and people sometimes come down here and they complain and, and they'll say something about, well, you know, these people, they're, they're hicks, they, they talk slow. And, and I'm like, you're the one that moved here. <laughs> I mean, get on board. And they talk about us Southern drivers. We don't know how to drive in snow, all right? Just, it just, it's that way. And, and everybody's like, well, I'm telling you up north, we're driving 65. Up north, you don't have the ice that we have, all right? So the ice will not allow you to drive 65. And, and the majority of the people you see that are wrecked and off in the ditches are, are not from here. Uh, we stay home when it snows. But anyway, that's just a different world. Uh, God loves the Tar Heels. Uh, he still, I think he loves a few of the Duke fans too. But anyway, we're not going to park there today. But I'm thankful that over the four, almost four decades, so many people have bought into the vision and the mission of the church. And folks, we still have a few of those original people. Uh, and, and I think of the sacrifices 
that you've made over the years so that others could hear and understand the gospel. I look at what happens on a, on a daily basis in the life of the church. We're standing on the shoulders of men and women, saints of God, who are faithful to teach week after week. And sometimes we talk about you know, having enough volunteers for holiday weekends or for, for big events and all those things. But think about the team, people that literally they ushered every Sunday for 20 years. They taught a Sunday school or Bible study class every Sunday for 20 years. They played the piano. They, they sang on the stage for 20 years. And folks, what happens is we are privileged to follow those people who are faithful and, and, and are willing to invest. Countless lives have been changed here in the Triangle and around the world. Many have gone to the ends of the earth on mission trips to share that Jesus loves people. He loves them and, and died for them. And, Many people in this room are products of the mission and vision of Calvary Relic Church. You've gotten saved and baptized here. Just a, a few weeks ago, baptizing uh, Stephen and Ashley's daughter. I remember Ashley growing up in my youth group. And now baptizing her child and seeing another generation being raised in the same church and understanding that Jesus Christ loves them. And he desires to transform their lives. See, raising people, raising their families in the church and making disciples in their own house. So I want to invite you to Matthew 28. We're going to look at the, uh, the mission we looked at last Sunday. Today we're diving into the vision of the church. Matthew 28, verse 18. It'll be on the screen. It says, Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God had a plan. He had a mission. And, and the, the, the passage in Mark 16 is a parallel passage. He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. What are he saying? He says the church has a mission, and we've been on that mission as, as a local church for 37 years. Our mission is clearly defined, and it dictates how we do ministry as a church. We're going to be about making disciples of all nations. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world, no matter the tribe, the tongue, or the nation. And then we go into the vision portion. Ultimately, we are to be declaring the name of Jesus in the triangle in the world. God has given us a responsibility. How are we going to carry out the mission? How are we going to fulfill the vision that God has for his church? Our vision is referenced in our logo. In fact, if you look at the logo closely, in the very center, there's a triangle. It's a reminder that everything we do must begin at home. It must start in the triangle. It must start in our city. It must start in our community. It must start where we live. At the core of all we do, we're here to make disciples. Folks, if we are not making much of Jesus and declaring his name in the triangle, we'll never do it in India. We'll never do it in Nicaragua. We'll never do it in, in Romania. We'll never do it in these other places. It's paramount for everything we do to declare the name of Jesus. And it starts in the triangle. It starts right here at home. That's the desire of what we've done. Folks, God has placed us in one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. That didn't happen by accident. God placed us here on this corner of Wake County, on this portion of Wake County. In fact, 37 years ago, after our very first service, you may not know this, a lady stood up and she said, Pastor Fry, she's like, that's my dad. Someone called me Pastor Fry the other day. I said, uh, that's my father. I said, my name is Pastor David. I said, but I, I feel old if you call me Pastor Fry. But, uh, uh, someone stood up and said, Pastor Fry, we have some land I'd like to donate to build the church. Very first Sunday, some churches spend years, 10, 15 years, accumulating the money to buy property to build it in Wake County. On the very first Sunday, she gave the land right now where our, our church is sitting. And people had offered her top dollar for the land. And she told developers it's not for sale. And then she turned around and she donated it to the church for the building. And years later, after she had passed away, her three daughters donated another three acres behind us. 
And, and folks, once our permit it comes through on putting in a new parking lot, we're hoping later this month, we're getting ready to clear the three acres behind us to put in some sports fields and make room for future growth for, for our young people, or for our kids, for our students. And folks, it's exciting to see what God is doing with the arrival of, of Apple, of, of Google, of VinFast, of Amazon, of Fujifilm, all of these companies that are moving to the triangle. Our population is exploding. 540 is already having pavements going down. Folks, we desire that those that are moving to the triangle, those that live here in Raleigh, understand who Jesus is and desire to have a personal relationship with him. At the forefront of everything we do as a church, we are to declare the name of Jesus in all things. From our services, every ministry of the church exists to fulfill the division of declaring the name of Jesus here at home and ultimately around the world. In fact, according to WREL, if that's where you get your news from, there, people are moving into Raleigh at 62.5 people per day. All right, just imagine, Wake County is the third fastest growing county in the nation. So if you live in, in Wake County, you are in good company. I mean, everybody else is moving here too, and it's exploding with growth. It's, it's, uh, according to the statistics on WRL, the county has a, a daily average growth in these different uh, cities or areas. Raleigh of 17.3 people per day are moving in to the city of Raleigh. Cary, if that's where you call home, 10.2. Apex is 5.8. Uh, Fuquay, for those of us in Fuquay, 4.4 people a day. Garner, 1.5. Uh, Anger, 0.1. So a little bit slower in Anger, but you're catching up, all right? But the reality is if you see your name on there, your, your town or your community on there, God is bringing people here in record numbers. I didn't know that Durham belonged in Wake County, but I saw that on there. So, but WREL, some of that's fake news anyway. I'm, 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 I'm meddling. I'm, I'm getting off track. But the number of neighborhoods under construction in our city are, are it's staggering what's happening. But folks, as disciples, we have a personal responsibility to share the hope of Jesus with others. Though we seek to meet physical needs, our ultimate desire is to meet the spiritual needs of others. We strive to help equip our people to understand how to share the gospel in a simple and effective way. And don't make it so complicated. Jesus loves people and he calls us to a better life. In fact, we share our story of hope and forgiveness. Let people know they don't have to get their life all cleaned up in order to come to God, to come to Jesus. Trust me, he is the only one who can clean any of us up. Were it not for God's grace, none of us could be saved. In fact, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of your own doing. In other words, if you're trying to figure out how to clean it up and, and get yourself all right so that God will forgive you, God will save you, you will never arrive. He says, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, not of works, so that no one may boast. In other words, he says, all of salvation is by God's grace. It's a gift that we don't deserve. And statistics show that half of disciples of Jesus say that they actually share their faith at least one time per year. That means literally half the church has shared their faith once in a year and the rest of us over on the other side are failing desperately at making disciples of Jesus, of declaring the name of Christ. If we are going to ever pierce the darkness and impact the triangle with the world, with the bright light of Jesus, folks, we must shine brightly as the light of the world. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. He says, let your light so shine. It goes on, brother, I'm sorry. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, he says, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Church, we have such a responsibility to declare the name of Jesus, 
to make much of him, not so that they're impressed with our, our ability, our talent, our skill, our intellect, none of that. No, he says, so that they may glorify our Father that's in heaven. Folks, if they're making much of us, we failed miserably. In fact, if we're pumping ourselves up to make, be proud about what we've done or what we've accomplished, in fact, 37 years is nothing without the power of God. In fact, I said last week, if all we do is gather to, to, to keep ourselves happy and encouraged, we have nothing more than a country club. God has given us a mission. He's declared a vision for our church that we're to be a bright light that shines for the world to see that Jesus Christ loves them. In Acts 1.8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And if you have a type A personality, if you're an extrovert, you will go, you will go and be my witnesses. No, that's not what he says. He says, and you will be my witnesses. We have a, a, a clear mission, a clear vision of what God wants to do. And he says, witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. God empowers us through the Holy Spirit to be a bold witness and declare the name of Jesus to our neighbors and the nations. He wants us to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ loves us. I want to, I want to share a story this morning. On Thursday, I had the privilege of, I'm going to, I'm going to tell on you, Kyle, so don't get too embarrassed. I had the privilege of, of having uh, coffee with Kyle uh, on a Thursday morning and he said, do you remember saying something about getting a nail in your tire uh, last Sunday, driving through this neighborhood over here, right beside the church? He said, yeah, that, that was me. He said, that was my neighborhood. It's going through my mind. I said, last year, we did a prayer walk in that neighborhood. I said, I don't know if you knew that, but I said, we prayed before any houses were built. Here we are. This is right across the street before any, they were just starting the construction. There's a couple more pictures, but we prayed for the people that would buy the houses next door to the church. There's your street. Kyle said, well, I guess we're your first people that you're reaching. Because today, there are brand new houses in Royal Creek, next door to the church, the people that we prayed that God would give us an inroad in, Kyle's one of those, and he's getting baptized this morning, just got saved recently. <laughs> Woo! That's awesome, church, because long before we knew Kyle and Aaron, God was preparing our hearts to minister and declare the name of Jesus in this city. If that doesn't give you chill bumps, you might need to get saved. I mean, you might need, but as I was, as I, as I sat there and I was, my wheels were turning on Thursday. I'm talking to him. I'm like, hold on. We just walked down your street just a few months ago and we saw the houses under construction. Those of you that participated that Sunday and we prayed, God, give us an impact Help us to declare your name in our city, in our neighborhood, our community. And folks, that when I say that God brings the door, the, the world to our doorstep, Kyle is from, from England. And it, he moved here to go to college and, and is now working here. And, and God is giving us an opportunity to impact our neighbors and the nations. So the, the city that was once a, uh, a tobacco field that was in the middle of nowhere, that it was like, who would even drive to Fuquay? I'm sorry, I moved there when there was like one grocery store and there was no, there was no Walmart, there was, no, uh, hair, uh, uh, there was none of these places to go to and shop and, and eat and all of those things and uh, there was no reason to go there. Downtown Raleigh seemed like 10 million miles away and I mean Apex, I mean that was like a whole different world and and Garner and Andrew, and, and now we're in the middle of all of it. And folks, God is bringing the world to our doorstep. He's giving us an opportunity to, to declare his name and, and to make disciples of Jesus. In Matthew 16, verse 18, that says, where Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
What an awesome thing to know that God's vision, his mission for the church, it can't be thwarted by, by man's evil devices. The devil has no control over what the church of Jesus Christ, dedicated, fully surrendered, can accomplish for the glory of God, church. We have a privilege And it's an awesome responsibility. Aren't you thankful that the gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church? He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a passion, a vision. Aren't you thankful for that promise this morning? One thing we should ask ourselves is, how am I doing at fulfilling the vision of the church? How am I doing at declaring the name of Jesus in the triangle? When you walk in your office tomorrow morning, you may be the only light in a dark world. You might be the only light in your neighborhood, on your street. You might be the only light in your family that will point them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, am I personally involved in the process? Do I pray over the lost of the triangle? Do I invite people regularly to join me in church and have an opportunity to hear that Jesus Christ loves them? So you say, well, pastor, that's your job. No, it's the job of every single follower of Jesus. God's given us a purpose. He's giving us a calling. And, and folks, don't make it so difficult because it's not. God gives us opportunities every day, whether it's the barista at Starbucks, the, the lady working at Chick-fil-A at, at, over at Harris Teeter on your street, the person who's mowing the grass. God gives you an opportunity to share that Jesus Christ loves them. Last Sunday afternoon, I was working in my yard. Daniel walks up to me next door. So said, what you doing? I was cutting up some plants, digging up, moving some things around, and had the opportunity to pray with Daniel and talk with him about his relationship with God. And I said, why don't you come to church next Sunday? And this morning, I was sitting right here. Service was starting. I looked over, and I see Daniel, and I'm like, I'm going to go sit with them. You never know the opportunity you may have to share that Jesus Christ. You don't know what, what they're dealing with. You don't know what their struggles might be. But folks, it's awesome to see the conversations with neighbors and coworkers and family and friends that God gives us. We talk about using I statements. When is the last time I invited someone personally to church? It's so simple. When's the last time I shared the gospel with someone? When's the last time I told them what, how Jesus has transformed my life? And what a powerful thing it is. Easter is four weeks away. As you leave the building this morning, there are invite cards out in the lobby. Pick these up. They're, it's a simple invitation. It looks nice. We've spent... Lots of money on it. Folks, all you have to do is place it in someone's hand and say, will you be my guest this Easter? Will you, how about joining me on Easter Sunday? And, and, and I'll treat them to lunch. Uh, and it might be the, the, the greatest thing you do all year is invest in someone's eternal destiny and seeing what God wants to do. Pray the Holy Spirit will speak to hearts that they will trust Christ as their Savior. And just yesterday, a lady texted me. She said she led her father-in-law to Jesus Christ And folks, we have been praying for him for years. Jesus still saves. He still transforms life. And she says, she said, my husband got to listen on the phone. And and, and she said, he heard his own father praying to receive Jesus Christ. And it gave me chill bumps as I thought about, folks, God is still saving people's souls. He's still transforming lives. Our Easter signs went up this week. Folks, pray that as people drive past our churches, they see signs all over our community, that God will use it to bring them under the sound of the gospel on Easter Sunday. When our Easter promotions start on social media, share them on your story, on on your page, and, and even better, bring someone with you so that you have an opportunity to change their eternal destiny. I'm thankful God doesn't call us to do a job we can't accomplish. He calls us. But he also empowers us. He equips us. And the moment we step out in faith and invite someone, folks, that's when that spiritual work begins to really transpire. Folks, Jesus Christ is working behind the scenes. And he'll use you and I in the process of accomplishing the vision for the church. 
He calls us to be witnesses here in Jerusalem, in the Triangle, in the Raleigh area. He calls us to be witnesses in Judea, in North Carolina. He calls us to be witnesses in Samaria, which is the, ultimately in the United States. He calls us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Aiden just graduated Friday from the Marine Corps. He's just starting. We're proud of you. In fact, let's give him a hand this morning. <clears throat> Alex is home from the Marine Corps as well. Let's give him a hand this morning. God is using them. And if you allow God to use you, you can be a bright light all around the world with the gospel. Later this year, we have uh, um, um, my niece, Anna Lewis, is in Guatemala right now on a mission trip. And Anna, we're praying for you. We're, we're praying that God empowers you and uses you mightily. We have mission teams that are preparing to, this summer to go to Nicaragua and, and to Romania in August. Folks, as we're preparing, let's pray that God empowers us to be a witness to the ends of the earth. Say, Pastor, what's the application? Ask yourself. How am I doing at declaring the name of Jesus in the triangle and in the world? How am I doing at making much of Jesus, of making disciples here locally in Raleigh and in with my family, with my neighbors, with my coworkers, with my friends? Ask yourself, when is the last time I invited someone to church? You see, as God is bringing people to our doorstep, if we aren't faithful to declare his name, folks, people will move here, but they may never know that Jesus Christ loves them. So I hear people all the time say, Pastor, we visited 20 churches before we found a church home. You know what people say? They say, Pastor, I thought moving to the Bible Belt, there'd be so many options that we couldn't make a decision of what church to plug into because there was just millions of options. Of the people I introduced this morning that joined the church, one of those families lives in Dunn. They drove 50 minutes to get here. Stephen and Ashley, Smithfield. Lady right here also lives in Smithfield, Miss Shirley. Ty and Jill Benson. You know what I say? Where the spirit's alive, it's worth the drive. When God is transforming lives, we drive that far to work every day and we don't even think about it. And yet, folks, I want to be a part of a church that's living on mission, that sees clearly the vision that God has called us to declare His name. And folks, it starts right here at home. And folks, it spreads. It goes beyond the walls of this church. It goes beyond the, the, the parameters of, of Wake or Johnson or Harnett or Chatham County or Fran God has called us to be a witness, church, and, and it requires us to invite. It takes us out of our comfort zones, uh, across the street, uh, across the hall at work, uh, across the cubicle, and, and invite someone at the gym, wherever. Take the opportunity God has called us to invite someone to Easter, that neighbor to come and join you on Easter Sunday. And then look around. Look for people, maybe they've grown discouraged. Maybe they're feeling like they're in this fight all along and they're, they're barely hanging on. Maybe you haven't seen them at church in a while. Maybe you should pick up the phone and say, you know what? God put you on my heart. I just want you to know that you matter. We miss you. We love you. We want to encourage you. Folks, you never know what a, a simple phone call or a text or a, a message or a, a visit or a, a card might be just the encouragement that they needed to say, you know what? 
I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue on declaring the name of Jesus. I want to make much of Jesus. What a joy for 37 years to be living on mission, living out the vision of declaring the name of Jesus. But church, we've just begun. As 540 is completed in the next year, can I just say we ain't seen nothing yet? If we think the community around us is exploding, we ain't seen nothing yet. We have not even scratched the surface. Folks, this building can't contain the crowds that God is sending our way. We put out more chairs today. We're going to put out even more for Easter. It won't be long before we're going to have to go to two services. And you know what's going to happen is you're going to be inviting and you're going to look and see, man, that neighbor I prayed for this week showed up this morning. Can I just tell you, your worship will be different because when you've invited, when you've prayed, when you've invested in the kingdom of God and God blesses, man, you can't wait. You want to jump up and just kick your heels together because it's an awesome thing to see the power of God at work in our midst. As people are going to come through the baptismal waters here in just a few moments, these are people that we have prayed for, folks. People that we've invested in and we prayed that God would open doors in our community, in our city, and He is. And folks, what happens is as we continue building relationships, God will continue to build His church. As we continue the mission of the church, folks, literally hundreds if not thousands of people will come through the baptistry, will join the church, will get plugged in and live on mission going out and declaring the name of Jesus in the triangle and in the world. Heavenly Father, would you speak to our hearts?